Yeah, I'm, I'm well, thanks. Lovely, lovely. Thanks for agreeing to be part of these people behind the papers project. Um, Anthony, like for status, uh, I would like to know uh, who are you uh, as an academic, uh, as a person, your personal background, where do you hail from, uh, what did you study, how did you, how did it come about that you chose psychology? Okay. Um, well, there's, I mean, there's a lot of story there. Um, I grew up in the Eastern Cape, around East London and Port Elizabeth, uh, and that was the sort of end of the apartheid era. So it was, it was really tense there. I mean, there was like a lot of like police and violence and political repression going on, and that that informed a lot of even my current thinking is seeing that those kind of social problems around me. And um, I ended up going to Rhodes um, to study literature, actually, not to study psychology. Um, and ended up just finding psychology interesting. And at that stage, there was also military conscription for white guys and apartheid. So I thought if I just stayed at university, I could avoid having to go and be in the army. So my academic career was actually direct result of um, the apartheid military conscription system and the fact that I didn't want to fight in the army. Mm. So, so I, 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 I did my undergraduate and, and master's degree at Rhodes um, and became much more interested in the sort of link between psychology and, and social issues and more critical approaches in psychology. And then after teaching a little bit at Rhodes and a little bit at WITS, I went to the United States um, into a program called History of Consciousness, which is it's a, it's, it's actually an interdisciplinary sort of critical theory, cultural studies type program. Um, and I studied there for a few years and then came back to South Africa and for quite a few years now have been based at UKZN in Durban. What exactly is this uh, history of consciousness? Because I saw that you have an MA in history yeah. of consciousness. Well, I, yeah, and now I have a PhD as well in, oh. in, in, in that same department. It's, it's a special department that was started up. I mean, that it's the only department of that kind sort of in the world that basically the, they started the department for, for people who didn't fit in other departments, that people who are doing critical work in the broad sort of social sciences but that it, the work wasn't really psychology or sociology or anthropology, but it was somewhere sort of at the interface of those things, but also taking very, very strongly sort of uh, critical stances, actually looking at the disciplines. And um, so um, they, 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 they are quite um, involved with teaching critical theory, but they're really interested in sort of innovative work that actually looks at things like um, well, for example, a lot of my work was, was not just in psychology, it's about psychology, of saying, well, what kind of system of knowledge is psychology? When people think using psychological concepts, what are the, what are the consequences for society? For instance, when they start looking in at certain forms of social deviance in terms of ideas of pathology, what does that actually mean? How does it cause society to respond to certain things? Um, and particularly, my, one of my questions there, for instance, was, and this has been a very big area of my work, is about violence in South Africa. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to say, how does psychology talk about violence? Because there's, mm -hmm. there's multiple theories in psychology. And I wasn't interested so much in testing any of those theories, but of saying, when you adopt this kind of theory, how does it make you look at the problem? And when you look at the problem that way, how do you end up understanding it and trying to intervene in it. So it's really um, uh, a sort of quite a, a theoretical, almost philosophical view of the discipline rather than simply conducting research within the discipline. Yeah. It's the idea that you can actually look, look at the discipline the way you would look at a social problem and, and think about it. And that's where my sort of big interest in trying to promote critical psychology in South Africa comes from. Um, and so history of consciousness was the perfect place because they, they were really interested in that work and they said that it's okay that it's sort of, it's not in psychology but it's about psychology um, and, it, and it uses quite a, a broad range of, of um, theoretical frameworks from, from, from all around. I mean, 
you know, um, cultural studies, critical theory, social constructionism, whatever. You can just all bring it together and, and, try, and, and try and generate something new and interesting. Um, and so there was enormous flexibility for me uh, studying there. Um, so, can you say uh, your history, like uh, growing up in West, in Eastern Cape, and lecturing there, and mm -hmm. going back to going to Vets and coming mm -hmm. back to KZN and going mm -hmm. to the US? Did it influence the way you kind of like, do stuff, you know, the way you interact? With yeah, people? I think every every place has a, a, a brings a particular element and brings a particular perspective and in that sense I think I mean I've been very fortunate to have been able to move around a bit and I think that's that I mean that's been a really important part of my intellectual development is mm -hmm. is having the opportunity I mean I, I, I initially you know really developing in in the Eastern Cape but um, also, the time I spent in the United States was interesting not only academically, but it was interesting culturally because it made me see things about society that weren't visible to me growing up in South Africa. Um, I mean, for instance, when I was growing up, a lot of the idea was, well, what's wrong in South Africa is apartheid, and when you get rid of apartheid, everything will be fine. And it was interesting going to a country like the United States where they don't, they, they don't have the, the same, I mean, they have certainly a history of racism, but, they ne but not, not in the kind that we had here. But seeing that there are fundamentally different social problems there that are, that are in, um, quite difficult to identify, and, and often our image of that society doesn't show those. But in fact, it's an incredibly um, exploitative and violent society in a lot of ways. And it was interesting seeing that, going from the myth of, you know, the world's democracy and yeah. freedom and and uh, uh, successful economic system and having those kind of really utopian even views of the United States and 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 realizing once you're there that in fact it's the embodiment of of a range of of shocking social problems. I mean, homeless people die in the streets in the major cities of the United and States, that and that's not the impression mm. that we have on them. So mm. so that got me thinking a lot more about about the economic side of society. I mean, I thought about other angles. I thought about prejudice and things like that. But being in the States got me thinking really about capitalism. And what does capitalism do to people? Like, how do they start thinking about themselves and each other? And that was really, really useful because it mean, meant when I came back to South Africa, I started noticing how much the, the democratic changeover was not just a change of rights and things like, and government, it was also a change of South Africa becoming much more embedded in the global economic system. And all those elements of media, consumer culture, um, actually started becoming more and more important parts of young people's lives. The idea of, of um, people having, really defining themselves in terms of their economic aspirations rather than other sets of values. And, and so it was interesting looking, coming back to South Africa, looking at, at what that had done to the United States and then watching what that does to South Africa. And so that's been one of my interests in actually looking at these things like sort of globalized capitalism, uh, the increasing sort of availability of mass media, like, you know, the DSTV channels, social media, internet, all of that kind of stuff. And that actually that stuff impacts on people in quite profound psychological ways. Um, which, which we don't think about in psychology usually. Um, we, 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 you know, we focus on the small interpersonal scale, often the intrapsychic stuff, and and saying, well, what does it mean to be part of global capitalism? As, and what does it mean psychologically? I mean, it's often posed as a political, economic, sociological yeah. question, and I'm really interested in, in then saying, well, what if we pose that as a psychological question about? the shaping of identities, of mm. values, of ways of interacting with, with people around us. Um, so that, yeah, that was a, a big influence. But, but the other big influence was probably just the, the Eastern Cape and, mm. and, and the, um, the real conservatism, the conservatism um, of, of growing up in the Eastern Cape at that particular point and feeling 
the real need to develop an alternative to that, and what does it mean to do, to to, to criticise the, the 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 sort of the the values of the particular culture that I come out of, um, and that was quite interesting. Um, my stay at Wits was was quite brief, um, and it was just a, really the experience of being at a very vibrant intellectual um, kind of space, um, and 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 being inspired by that, but. Um, but I was never a Joburg person. I'm a bit of a country boy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, like, uh, during your formative like, academic career, yeah. who are the people who you can pick up and say, uh, these are particular people who influenced my yeah. thinking? Yeah, no, they're, they're very definite people. I mean, certainly, um, as I started reading broadly as an undergraduate, uh, people like Don Foster, his work was, was important for me, in, um, his stuff at UCT. Graham Hayes um, and his work in the journal Psychology and Society, PINS, and that was one of the things that made me want to come to, to KZN, is um, that, that, that he'd been really keep, keeping an exciting tradition alive. And then at WITS, of course, there were, there were great people. Um, Martin, who um, has really just been a, a huge intellectual and, and personal influence on me in terms of, of, of the, his, his consistent um, kind of engagement with uh, quite radical ways of thinking in psychology, um, but also certainly people like Joel Eagle um, and, and many other people um, around there. Derek Hook was, was also around um, <coughs> as a student at that point, but, but already quite uh, making an intellectual impact. So there's, 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 been, there's been many people um, but I'd say those, yeah, those must be the, the, the key ones at that stage. I'm, I'm like thinking now, uh, like from a, a personal perspective and um, from hearing some students talking, uh, the journey, uh, well, like uh, the interface one has to choose between mm -hmm. uh, I want to be an academic, I want to be a researcher, to be clinical psychologist. Mm. Did you ever had, uh, did you ever came to that crossroad? I mean, you said crossroad. Yeah, sure. It, you know, it happened to me in a in a different way than I think it happens to other people. Um, you know, I always when I was at school, I always just wanted to go to university. I had in my head, university is going to be great and it's going to be interesting and intellectually stimulating. And I hated high school. I mean, I just wanted to be out of there. And so in my head, it was like, just get through high school, get to university, and, and and there'll be like these like fascinating people exchanging mm -hmm. ideas and it'll just be so uh, exciting. And I got there and it wasn't quite that. I mean, it was yeah. cool, but it wasn't, it wasn't as great as I thought it was going to be. But there were a few key people that influenced me. Um, one of my English lecturers, Don McLennan, had a, he really inspired me intellectually. Um, another lecturer... Um, that, that probably had a, a very important influence on me was actually Andrew Brunk, um, who's, I mean, he's mainly known as an author, but in fact his books are not nearly as good as his lectures were. Um, and, and in psychology, there wasn't much, to tell you the truth. Mm. There, were some, there were some interesting people, um, but for the most part, a lot of my intellectual inspiration came from books. I was one of those unusual students who just went to the library every few days and just took lots of books out and just read them all. And so there was a lot of kind of international influence. I was reading a lot of the South African stuff. I started, you know, discovering Franz Fanon and Vico and those people and really getting a sense of that there was a, a hidden South African tradition that wasn't being taught. Um, and that was very important to me. But then, you know, when I, when I was studying as an undergraduate, I didn't really have career plans. I thought, yeah, uh, I'll study a bit of English, I'll study a bit of psychology, maybe I'll become a high school teacher. Mm -hmm. And then, there were, as I mentioned, there was a problem, well, if I leave university, I'm going to have to go mm -hmm. serve in the apartheid army, and I wasn't prepared to do that. So I thought, well, let me just stay at university <laughs> <laughs> for no better reason. Mm -hmm. And then I stayed, and I, I did... More or less by accident, I mm. cho ended up in honours in psychology because it was possible, because I mm. had it as a major. And, and then the natural thing seemed to be to go to a master's. And mm. there was never a, a, a moment when I said, oh, yes, 
I'm making a decision to go into this mm -hmm. area of psychology. Clinical psychology never especially interested me. Um, I was more interested in the sort of academic thinking, reading side. Mm -hmm. And then, as a master's student, I also started tutoring a bit. And that was maybe the first time in my life when I thought, this is, an, this, is a, this is a thing that I can do, where I can have fun and they pay me at the same time. <laughs> yeah. So I should probably just do this forever. Yeah. And so it really went from that, from being a tutor to taking on a, a little bit of teaching mm -hmm. more formally to, you know, eventually a junior lectureship opened. Mm -hmm. And at that point, a, a career had sort of started happening without me even ever planning it. Mm -hmm. Um, and it just carried on from there. Then I got offered a great scholarship to go to the United States. Um, and when I came back, I, I got the, the position at UKZN. So, so there wasn't a lot of there wasn't a lot of planning around this career, and there wasn't a lot of there weren't big moments of decision where I said, "Do I want to do this or do I want?" There was one moment um, when I had to decide between two things that I really enjoyed. The one being music, and I was working as a sound engineer and a performing musician and it was part of like okay I could try and make a career out of that but it's such an unreliable career it's so hard to for that to be stable and you know you at the whim of popularity and yeah. like and and but I enjoyed the academic stuff as much mm -hmm. and the academic stuff I suppose it was an opportunity for an actual job with a monthly paycheck, and that was very attractive. <laughs> so, so in your spare time, do you still? Yeah, do I play. Music I play around a bit, not as much as I I, I used to, but um, um, and also because I mean, you know, initially I thought go, going into academia that's great because it's mm. it's kind of a part time job to do, but uh, and I'll have a lot of free time for other mm. things, and 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 it hasn't turned out like that. I mean, I I work much more than eight hours a day. But I, but I enjoy the work, so, mm. so that's great. So if I spend my evenings reading an interesting book, that's Sorry. yeah, that's okay with me. Mm. Um, yeah, so it, 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 I feel like I stumbled across mm. um, a lot of these things. It wasn't a lot of planning. There wasn't a lot of sort of agonizing decision making. It was like, okay, this seems to be working. Nice. See, see, see where it goes, mm. <laughs> and and seems to have gone to interesting places. Yeah. And I've been reading some of your articles and mm. I've realized that uh, one of your interests is violence. Mm -hmm. How did you reach that point? Did the history of growing up in Eastern Cape, uh, witnessing apartheid and mm -hmm. going to US and mm -hmm. watching uh, homeless people mm -hmm. and uh, the whole homicides in the US, yeah. kind of like influence you? To yeah, say, I think you know, a, a lot of it had to do with, with growing up. Um, uh, in the early years of my life, it, it, I mean, I always the question of violence, even as a as a young teenager, worried me. Um, partly because the, the the I mean, our society was so violent at that point. I mean, you know, and I can I, I remember little things. I, I used to I, I used to walk from my house to the public library in town. It wasn't very far, about a half an hour walk, and I would walk past the police station every time, and I would. I would actually hear people being assaulted in the police station. And I remember, maybe I was 12, 13, 14 years old. And it shocked me, you know. And I, and, it, and I would go home and I would be worried about what was going on. Why were I hearing those screams? Mm -hmm. and, and, and that shock never left me. I mean, it just mm -hmm. became something I worried about. But, but the other thing is, I mean, people talk about about that moment of South African history in terms of like oh, yeah, apartheid. We all understand the police brutality, but also growing up in a almost entirely white community, a privileged community, and the incredible violence within that community. The fact that at school people were just beaten up all the time. I would hear the kind of the neighbors like beating up his wife. It seemed that. That, that no one tells the story of the other forms of violence in that society. And, and, and I also thought about that a lot. I used to want, you know, what, what, are these, what are these bullies actually up to when they come looking for kids in the park to beat up? What are the guys at school who are always, you know, picking on people? What, what, what's that about for them? Um, when these, you know, when I hear these, these domestic violence incidents 
in the neighbor's house. Like, mm. what, what craziness is going on there? And, and how does that fit with this other stuff? What's the link between those things and this other fact that I'm expected to actually become a soldier? I'm expected to put on a uniform and carry a gun yeah. and go and shoot people. Mm. And, 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 and that, and that this, in this police, when I walk past this police station, I, every now and again I encounter this terrible evidence of violence. And, and I, was, I, I, I was troubled by that in a way that has never left me. And so much of my intellectual work has been said, I, I want to explain this. I want to really, I want to come up with a, some kind of coherent way of saying what, what made South Africa become violent and what can we do about it. And I mean, the interesting thing is there was also a belief until quite recently that the changeover of political power will lead to the disappearance of violence. Mm. You know, we won't have those terrible, uh, those laws, and the, the, we won't have the, the, you know, the army and the police going in and, and, mm. to, and kicking down people's doors and things like that. And then everything will become nice. We will have our TRC, and we'll have our reconciliation, mm -hmm. and we'll have our human rights, and the police will have to obey the law mm. and protect the public. And then, of course, we started seeing that that it wasn't just happening by itself. Mm. And people started getting worried about violent crime more and more. But at the same time, a lot of these other things, I mean, you know, it's really interesting. The police currently kill nearly twice as many people as they did under apartheid every year. I mean, that's a, that's a shocking piece of information. Yeah. I mean, what does it mean that we, we have a, a constitution, we have human rights, but, but that the state is actually still involved in massive acts of violence? Mm -hmm. And so I think in a deep sense, we didn't solve that problem in South Africa. Mm. We focused so much on, on, on race and saying, well, if we solve the problem of race, then everything else see. will go away. And then become clearer and clearer that, I mean, many people are saying this now, that, that by emphasizing only that problem, we also didn't address economics. We didn't address the distribution of wealth. And I think that's, I mean, that's quite a public debate now, which yeah. is very important. <laughs> But what I want to add to that is that we didn't solve the problem of violence either. Mm. We didn't solve the problem of why, um, why, why, why people in everyday life, um, you know, um, get involved. Uh, why they beat their children? Why, why, why they beat their, their wives yeah, and right. girlfriends? Why, why criminals in South Africa are different from in most of the rest of the world, where they they use much more violence? I mean, interesting. Um, you know, the, the recent research has been arguing that South Africa actually doesn't have very much more crime than, than similar countries, mm. but that the crime is much more violent. And that, that, that really flips that question around yeah. in an interesting way. And it seems, what, what interests me is not, to, you know, not these stories of, oh, yeah, these you know, guys broke into a house and tortured someone and shot the baby. I mean, yeah, sure, those are terrible. What interests me is the, the pervasive violence the fact that, that, that there's so much violence between people in social networks. Mm. That, that violence is absolutely normalized, for instance, as a way of child rearing. Mm. That violence is a way of, of people in intimate relationships resolving conflicts between each other. Um, that violence is a way of law enforcement. I mean, we just assume that. We just assume, oh, we must have this shoot-to-kill policy and we must bring back the death penalty. But when you look at those, all of those are arguments for violence, of saying we've got a social problem, the way in which we should solve the social problem is through more violence, not through less violence. And there seems to be a real failure of any kind of alternative account which says, no, all of these things, um, all of these things have got other possible solutions that we haven't put on the table. You can, you can be insulted by someone without needing to be violent back to them. You can be frustrated by your kids without hitting them. You can, um, you can need to do something about crime without telling the cops to start shooting people. And, and it's, that, it's the absence of those explanations that I, I really want my work to contribute to at the moment. And when you write about crime and, and violence and mm -hmm. you get frustrated and you kind of try and change the world, mm -hmm. 
now you have the information, what do you do with it? Like, yeah. you look at frustrated when you have so much information, when <laughs> you make so much sense and nobody seems to be yeah. listening to you. Yeah. Um, yes and no. I get frustrated, but that's why I love teaching. Because there's nothing as rewarding as working with young people who are, going, who are at that moment in their lives where they, they're learning what contribution they're going to make to society and working with them creatively, introducing them to new ideas, debating vigorously yeah. with them, and, and giving them tools that they're going to actually do something with. I don't know what they're going to do with it, but that, that sense that they, they, they're enthusiastic, they're at the start of their lives, and, and that, you know, however much frustration I may, may feel with the politicians and everyone else in the society, I think it's really the sort of emerging generations that are going to take this problem. And so for me, being an academic is first of all being a teacher and actually sharing those ideas with the, with the, with the, with the rising generation that are going to, going to tackle that problem. And that's just, that's just so rewarding for me. I mean, I just, I have so much fun lecturing. I mean, it's just, I can't believe they also pay me a salary. And it's not even lecturing. Yeah. Um, I look at it here, so yeah. that you are very much involved with community outreach projects. Yeah, yeah. And that's Since yeah. uh, you, you stay at Rhodes. Mm, yeah, yeah. Now, I've been involved with a lot of community based staff. I currently work with uh, um, several organizations. Um, uh, one of them is, for instance, the Advice Desk for the Abused, which provides sort of support and legal advice for uh, victims of domestic violence and family violence. And for me, that that's part of it all. I mean, part and uh, uh, that that I don't think um, that you uh, you can only learn so much from books, and then you have to be operating in the real world as well. And part of my community kind of activism is not just to help those individual people, those individual cases, but to learn from that. To, to, to have that contact as a way of get, getting practical experience of what are the problems that people are facing in their everyday lives, what, what are the possible solutions, and, and to both provide um, the sort of moments of, of, of assistance, but also to provide myself with material to take back into my intellectual work and back into my teaching. So in that sense, the, the intellectual, theoretical stuff, the community activism, the teaching, they, they, they're all just different, different angles on, on really one project. I don't see this as, as like a separate things that I do. Oh, I do this on the weekend and that during the week. It all, it's, it all informs my, 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 what I do, which informs what I think, which informs what I share in teaching and writing. Yeah. So it's some kind of thing. Yeah. Everything influences yeah. yeah. I also saw one interesting campaign that you are coordinating, mm. I think it's a safe campus. Yeah. Mm. Um, there's a limit to what parts of that I can discuss <laughs> in public, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, some of, there's some elements of that which um, might cause me to fall out of favor mm. <laughs> with mm. people who I yeah. need not to fall out of favor with. Um, that's an interesting project. Um, it's a typical kind of thing. I was working with my students, uh, and 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 I, uh, you know, they're just trying to talk to them a lot about what are the practical problems they're facing. One of the things they started talking to me about a lot was the fact that they they experience certain kinds of harassment and violence on campus. Um, a lot of a lot of um, girls living in res, for instance, would talk about. Real, real patterns of sexual violence mm -hmm. that they were having to, to deal with all the time. Our students getting raped. Um, a lot of uh, violence in their relationships, getting, getting beaten up by their boyfriends, things like that. And also then other, other kinds of violence. Gay students experiencing kind of uh, homophobia and getting harassed, getting beaten up. Um, other problems, uh, African foreign students experiencing xenophobia. Being told they aren't wanted here, being threatened with violence. Um, even I had an incident once where one of our the, the university security guards threatened to kill one of our master students from the DRC. I mean, wow. it's a shock. Um, and and so I started saying, well, wait a minute, let's work. Let's work in this in 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 this community, in the university community. 
and, and, and see what we can do. So, so there were also a number of angles to that project. One of the projects was just to, to um, support the students who wanted to mobilize and form their own student organizations and their own campaigns and have their own support structures, which was, um, that was quite um, an, an interesting part of the project. And the other part was to say, well, look, let's do the research. I mean, if I'm hearing these stories, mm. I mean, the anecdotes are, are very worrying, but let's, let's, let's have some substantial research and, 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 and really analyze what's going on. What, mm. what, what, how serious are these problems? To what extent are they occurring? Um, so we developed that network, and then we also said, okay, we need to network amongst the service providers, yeah. the student counseling, the security, um, the, the student services um, within the university. Let's, let's get everyone networking much more closely and much uh, with a clearer understanding of how to address these problems. And, um, and, and that, so that, that's what that project's been about. It's been, it's been a difficult project, actually, surprisingly, um, because what I didn't expect is I thought, when I went into the project, I thought, okay, well, the university's not aware of the seriousness of this problem. And, this, and, uh, and some of the service providers and the students themselves aren't aware of, of how many positive alternatives there are. So, mm -hmm. so let's just put all that on the table. Let's, let's bring the, what, what we know about this field, our expertise, and, and let's do it. And in fact, what was interesting is it became clearer and clearer that in fact there was actual opposition to this work, which shocked me. I, I never expected that. I thought maybe there's ignorance, maybe there's lack of motivation, mm -hmm. but the idea that they're actively people who don't want that sort of work done. Um, they're actively people who protect perpetrators of violence against other students. That was that was deeply shocking to me. Um, and and it made me quite worried about that project. On the other hand, um, what happened with the project is the Commission for Gender Equality became interested in it. And they said, look, this is a, this is really important stuff. Let's 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 extend this to a couple of other universities, and and let's develop a kind of national policy, and let's take it to the Minister of Education and say these are going to now be future guidelines for universities. This is how you deal with 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 these kinds of, of um, problems within university communities, because because my campus is not different from other campuses. I mean these are these are really widespread problems at all the the kind of residential universities. Um, so it's been a it's it's been a it's been an interesting but actually for me a difficult a difficult project because you know whenever I've been involved with community based organisations everyone had the same goals and the same values and wanted to do the same work and it's been disturbing being in an environment where there isn't agreement about that 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 in fact there seems to be a very strange. Um, sort of other tendency which which is actually to firstly just to try and cover stuff up but yeah. worse than that to actually to to to, to for, for various reasons to protect people who shouldn't I mean not to protect victims to protect perpetrators um, and I don't know I still haven't worked up what to make of that and how to go forward with that um, but it has made it seem more difficult and 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 in a way, just more upsetting for me than it might otherwise. I mean, you know, uh, you, working with violence is always upsetting. But usually, you're working with a team of people who are so positive and mm. have such positive values that, that that's what really keeps it going. And, and feeling that fragment and feeling that you're actually fighting with people who have, who have actually quite opposed values, um, I, I think makes it more challenging. You know, sitting here listening to you, uh, I really uh, feel humbled to have uh, had this conversation with you. And I really want to know what keeps you going, what, what makes you take that further step, because, you know, academics, most mm -hmm. academics, they just um, concentrate on their academic uh, mm -hmm. work, lecturing, and whatnot. What makes you to be so much concerned about your surroundings? Um, I, you know, I, I, I don't know. It's not even. It's not even a choice. Mm. It's like I walk down the street. I see stuff. I react to it. That's who I am. There's no point at which I say, "Should I do this? Should I do that?" 
you know. I mean, that story I told you of walking to the library as yeah. a young teenager and hearing, and hearing, hearing those screams. And I don't know why someone else might have managed to ignore that, but I, I couldn't. Something inside me couldn't stop thinking about that. And so that's, that's what I feel all, all the time, really, that, that I notice certain things and I can't stop thinking about them. And so I try and fix it. I mean, I'm just a guy who likes to fix things. <laughs> and that's, that, that's it. It's like it just a, it's a kind of an intuitive impulse. That, um, and I find it rewarding. I mean, if I, didn't, if I noticed that stuff and didn't try and fix it, I would actually get depressed, I think. And, and I, would be, I would be more frustrated and, and kind of demoralized by it. Um, and it, and it, it, yeah, it feels like, you know, why not, why not actually try and make it better? I mean, I also want to live in a world where things are better. That, that's better for me if I live in a world where people don't want to hurt each other. It's not only better for the other victims, it's better for everyone. And I think that's, that's one of the things that we've lost a little bit in South Africa, you know. Um, the interesting thing was, you, you know, when, 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 when South Africa was going through a very, very bad time at the end of apartheid, and there was a lot of political repression, you know it had one good outcome. I'm not saying it was good because it was terrible, but it had one good outcome, is it made people want to change things. You know, like people were just like, no, we can't carry on like this. And, and if there's one thing that worries me now, it's that increasingly people have lost that desire to, to really change things collectively. And, and they've, they've become more and more concerned with just like, um, well, I want to change it for myself. In other words, I want to make a bunch of money. I want to become famous and popular and, you know, um, that kind of thing. So, and, and, and to me, that's, that's a loss. Uh, it's a loss in our society that, that we need to have, um, we need to have a sense of, of, of that we're part of a society and that part of, uh, of making things better is making the society better. And, and there's a real danger that the people who are talking that kind of talk are actually d dishonest people at the moment. I mean, there's, you know, young political leaders who are saying, oh yeah, I'm going to, you know, I'm the new liberation, like you know, we the young lions. And, and, and when I look at them, I don't see that. I see, um, I see people who, 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 who are trying to be rich and powerful. Mm. And they've stolen that, those ideas and those words um, to misuse yeah, for their own purposes. Mm. And I think, I think um, one of the nice things about teaching is that a lot of my students want to take that back. And they want to say, no, we actually we won't. We won't be dictated to by politicians. Mm. We actually want to get involved with, with our own lives, with our own society, and we want to commit ourselves to it. And, and, and getting that interaction, I mean, for me, that is, that's worth more than any salary that the university could pay me. You really yeah. seem to be enjoying your interaction with your students. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I mean, that's, a part of, that's my favorite part of the job. Mm -hmm. You know, I write because, because you have to write yeah. if you're an academic, but... Uh, but actually, the, my, my happiest moments are when I'm, when I'm working with my students. Uh, yeah. But like, you know, you, you've touched on one of the most important things, writing mm -hmm. within academia. Uh, do you still remember the first paper that you wrote or the first paper that you got rejected to? Yeah. You know, a lot of rejection. Yeah. Uh, like you know, I, 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 I avoid rejection by by submitting very little. <laughs> my first paper, I remember my first paper very clearly, and wow. the weird thing is when I look back on it, I think it was quite good. I look back on it one of my better papers, mm. but it was a paper I wrote at a master's, <coughs> as a master's student and presented at a conference, and it was, it was quite an esoteric paper. It was a theoretical critique of phenomenology, mm. actually. Um, and I just, I just had this idea, and I put it out there, but I also tried to... That, that, that was the interesting thing with the paper. I tried to have fun. I tried not to be too serious with it. And I think that's what made it good. That, that the paper was, it was, it was very kind of abstract in, 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 in a sort of theoretical critique that it was trying to develop. But it was also trying to say, in a way, make an argument, you know what, the reason we, the reason these ideas are important is because, because they change that. Mm. And even sometimes the intellectual debate is fun, 
actually you don't have to get too like you know serious and full of like drama and conflict about it you can have fun with ideas and I try to put that into the paper and, and I think it worked it worked relatively well yeah. so one of the advice is like uh, as much as one can try it one should have fun yeah, the, I would. Right. That's uh, one of my key. The two things I, I would say to any sort of emerging academic with their writing is keep it simple and have fun, because those are the two things people do wrong. They, they, they firstly, this idea that that if you make doing serious academic writing, it must yeah. be difficult. Their sentences must be <laughs> complex, and you must use a lot of. That people must let go of that. trying to be complex and difficult, and use what is use like this academic technical language. And they must try and talk the way they speak, because when you speak, everyone understands you. But when people get this idea, it's like this, that it has to be this text that is just so indecipherable and oppressive, yeah. actually. <laughs> um, and, 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 and imagine that that's what makes it good. It makes it, you know, that, 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 that inaccessibility makes it good. That, that's rubbish. I mean, you look at the really influential writers, many of them have been people who who the thing they did was they is they made their ideas accessible mm. and for me that's also it's not just that um, the, the, your work becomes more accessible that it, it, it more happens then if if, if if people can just read what you're doing if it, if it can reach a wider audience it has a it, it has more effect in the long run and it's and it's less strange to write you know you just don't have to like get your head into that thing and then also the idea that because it's because it's academic writing, it's got to be it's got to be very dry and very serious, mm. you know. And this whole thing, oh, you must never use like the first person. Everything must be yes. scientific and neutral. And why? You know, that's mm. rubbish. I mean, if people, especially in psychology, I mean, why are we doing psychology? Because we want to understand each other. Yeah. What's important in psychology is our subjective experience. I mean, sure, we want to theorize it in interesting ways and research it and understand it, but, but that's well, what's important. So why not put that in the work? Why not put yourself yeah. as an author in the work? And, and I think this is why, you know, um, people like Martin Terreblanc have, have been really good at this, uh, of, 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 of bringing a personal element into the work and, and of, of, of saying that that's okay. You, you know, we're not trying to do these kind of... Uh, weird, arcane, abstract, scientific articles for minor journals mm. that no one will ever read. We want to write stuff that that we enjoy writing and that other people enjoy reading. I mean, to think about that question, is the person reading this going to enjoy it? I mean, no one tells you to ask that question. Yeah. They're like, oh, is this rigorous? Are the referencing systems <laughs> correct? Is your methodology yeah, sound? Yeah, okay, cool. Those are all important questions. But ask yourself the question is... Uh, is the, is, is, the, is the person gonna, who, who's going to look at this, are they going to understand it or are they going to enjoy it? If, you're gonna, if you achieve those two goals, you've got good writing on your hands. Um, but there's something we have to let go of. I mean, even I know, I tell my students this story and they, they don't really believe it. <laughs> They're like, yeah, sure, 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 but, but really you have to be like difficult and serious <laughs> and, and, and all of that. Um, and, and you do, you have to be rigorous. I mean, it's not, you know, you're not just making up fairy tales. You do need, you, you do need rigor. You do need to understand your subject well. You do need to be clear in your grasp of the concept and in your analysis. Your methods do need to be sound. Yeah. But, um, but that's the background. Mm -hmm. And the real thing is. is communicating with people and enjoying communicating with people. Mm -hmm. That's what writing is really about. <laughs> I also saw something which really interested me about you, um, and it makes sense now while I'm listening to you talking, uh, your interest in gender. Mm. Um, I'm kind of like thinking, how, how do you find a fit between gender and violence? Yeah. But it's something that you like, thought of, or was it like a coincidence? Well, it's, I, 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 I'm not too sure, but 
one of the things is when you start studying violence, the one thing you cannot escape from is gender. I mean, the first thing to know about the, the most robust statistic about violence is that no matter where it happens in the world, no matter when it happens in history, the perpetrators are usually men. Mm. So there's something about masculinity that we need to understand when we, when we understand violence. But that's not what people usually think of when they think of violence and gender. They don't think about questions of masculinity. They think about sexual violence. Yeah. And when people you know, start, when newspaper articles get hysterical and people start getting worried about their personal safety, often they're thinking about rape, really. I mean, this, mm -hmm. is, this is one of the, the, the forms of violence that distresses people the most, that there's the most kind of emotional impact on that. So in, in that sense, there's a, there's a gender question there. Um, why, why, are, why, does, why does violence happen in, 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 in those kind of sexual ways? But, but as soon as you ask, it becomes clear there's a whole lot of other things. For instance, a lot of violence happens in relationships, even though it's not sexual violence, it's kind of yeah. idea of domestic violence, intimate partner violence. And there's something going on there with gender as well. And also, I mean, the other big interesting aspect um, of violence in South Africa is homophobic violence. I mean, this idea of corrective rape. I mean, this is a crazy idea. I mean, this is one of the craziest ideas I've ever heard of. So, so you're going to, the, so say there's this lesbian and, and some guys are like, well, we don't like that she's a lesbian. Let's rape her and that will maybe make her become straight. I mean, no one can believe that story. I mean, that, if, if there's one thing it's not going to make a, some, you know, someone decide they, they want to have sex with guys, raping them is not going to make, make them come to yeah. that conclusion. So, so, so what's behind that? I mean, it's so illogical, it's so profoundly, it's not even illogical, it's like anti-logical. Um, so, so, so that must mean that there's really interesting psychological stuff going on. And, and, and that interests me. You know, why, why, would, uh, why would someone who, who says, ah, oh, I don't like gay people, so want to go beat them up? I mean, geez, like, get away from them if you don't like them. Don't go like... I mean, when you beat someone up, you're touching them a lot, aren't you? Yeah. I mean, that's kind of weird, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> um, so, 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 so it's interesting. there's really interesting psychological stuff going on around, around gender identities, around sexual orientations. Um, and, and, and these seem to be very big psychological questions. Um, and they're also important ones because, because a lot of, of violence takes those patterns. Interestingly, quite a lot also doesn't. Um, a lot of violence in South Africa, I mean, th th this, this is a very interesting point that I'm making in the work I'm doing at the moment. Mm -hmm. Violence as part of crimes is actually quite only a very small part of, what, of the violence in South Africa. The hijackers and mm -hmm. muggers and that, actually they are, are, are really, they, they don't make up the majority of the violence. A lot of violence is fights. You know, there's no, no one's trying to steal from anyone else. It's guys getting into a fight. And it, the emphasis there is on guys and in certain age groups. I mean, look at 18 to 27. That's, that's where it's, it's happening. And, they, and these are disputes that are happening. They're not about property. They're about social status. Mm -hmm. It's about, like, hey, you check me. Yeah. Like, it's like, you know, some guy's asserting his status over someone That's else somebody. or some guy's mm -hmm. feeling that he's been dissed by someone and now what he has to do is he has to get his status back. And, and this is actually one of the biggest patterns of violence um, and the biggest pattern of homicide in South Africa, actually. And interestingly, I mean, men are seven times more likely to be murdered than women in South Africa. I mean, that's, yeah, that's a, a number people don't really think about. But, but it also means that gendered violence is not only gendered by men against women, it's gendered violence between men. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's violence that has to do with something about masculinity, something about a masculine sense of dignity, a masculine mm -hmm. sense of status, um, and that men start getting into these little battles with each other around, around the status and this dignity. Um, and that accounts for huge patterns of violence in South Africa. And I don't think you can understand that without understanding gender, without understanding the social mm -hmm. construction of masculinity, really. That, that's what it comes down to. Because those things aren't about, oh, I've got no money, I need to like, you know, hijack your car. That, it's not about that kind of stuff. It's about, it's about a sense of self that is, 
that has been um, that has been socialized, really. I mean, that that has come out of sort of cultural values. Men need to be like this. And they need to be in control. They need to have social dominance. Yeah. Um, and and then that gets played out as hey, <laughs> as acts of violence. <laughs> Yeah, um, uh, between people. Um, but do you think psychologists or academics still have the role to play in society? With all these theories, with all these observations, what what specific role? Would it yeah, no, I think there's a there's a huge role to play. Um, I mean, I think it's a decisive role in mm -hmm. society, and I think it's a problem that mostly when people think about psychology, and certainly when you know, our students come in first year thinking about psychology, mm. they think about therapy. They think that's yeah. psychology. They think, you know, Dr. Phil is yeah, psychology. Is. You must go and become a therapist and you must give, you know, must, you must help people work through their personal emotional problems. Sure, that's, that's fantastic. I'm all behind that project. But there's a, there's a project that's bigger than that, I think, which is psychology can understand certain things about people. It can understand how certain things go wrong. Um, once again, if we bring it back to this theme of violence, psychology knows a lot about why some people become violent and others don't. They know about, right down from the earliest attachment relationships in infancy through to, to social learning in adolescence, through to peer group pressure, through to the social construction of gender. They know all of this stuff. I mean, the literature is there, the research is there. What they really need to do is they need to be feeding this back into the, pe the social decision makers. I think that's, that's the gap that psychology hasn't taken seriously. I mean, I think, you know, when, when, when people in government start making plans about stuff, they bring in their economists and they bring in their development theorists. And I think they need to be bringing in some psychologists as well to say, you know, if you want to, of course you must have your economists and everyone there, but there's some problems that we could really do a lot about simply by utilizing what psychologists already know and contributing it to the social transformation process. And I think that, that I'd like to, to, to make a contribution there in, 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 as much as I could. And I think I'd like to see psychology as a discipline making a much bigger contribution. Um, and there's, yeah, there's, 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 there's just a huge amount that we know that, that, that could lead to better decision making, better social policies, forms of education, forms of child rearing, social welfare policies, um, yeah, all, all things like that. I think I think we've got a lot to say. Yeah. We need to bridge that gap. But how? How do we bridge that gap? Yeah. That's that, <laughs> <laughs> that I wish I wish I knew the answer yeah. to that. I mean I don't I don't know. I, I think I think we haven't we haven't thought enough and we haven't done enough to, 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 to solve that question. Um, and it's easy to say, oh, well, well, let's write something, let's publish something. Yeah. I'll, I'll publish an article in SHAP. Well, no one's ever going to read that article. I mean, maybe three of my friends will read it, you know. That's not, that, that's not the answer. Um, maybe my students when they graduate will take up leader posi leadership sure. positions and yeah. they'll start using this this sort of this these intellectual mm. resources maybe that will happen um, at the moment one of the things i'm trying to do is to write a, a book that i don't want to be an academic book i actually want it to be a popular book just so people can read it people who who you know when they you know sitting at home they they worry like why is South Africa violent i want to talk to them about that and hope that those ideas filter through um, but at a certain point, I think it also we need to plug more effectively into the sort of big decision making, the, the high levels of political decision making. And that's why I was excited by this project that, that the Gender Commission came on board mm. with, because they can they can do, they can say, okay, we'll, we'll take your research, mm. we'll turn it into sort of legally formulated policy, and we'll present it to the minister, and then he can implement it. And and that seems to me pretty cool. If we can start doing more stuff like that, I'd. I'd be happy, um, but but that's a it's a very new kind of area for me. I mean, I don't I don't understand how this yeah. like you yeah, know politics and yeah. government actually work. Um, mm. um, that seems to be a very complicated <laughs> part of society to me. Yeah. yeah. No, thanks, Anthony, for your time and um, for hosting us in your house. Cool.